All right, we uh, are here with Tom Stallings all the way out from West Virginia. And uh, last night was the first time I met Tom and it was at uh, the No Crime in Sin uh, uh, premiere of Christy Johnson's film, which was phenomenal. And uh, what that was all about actually plays into what Tom is gonna be talking about. And it's really deception and it's, it's covering in the name of religion and institutions. This man has a story, and I really honestly, I just learned how to pronounce his last name. I just learned he came, comes from West Virginia, and just two or three facts about his story, but uh, Phyllis, uh, a, a big supporter of uh, the ministry, our husband Larry, Phyllis told me, hey, you should really contact Tom. I said, why? Well, come to find out, Tom has a story that has been all over the news, and uh, they have fought, as Paul says, the good fight. And he's still fighting the good fight. And the story is going to blow your mind uh, like Christie's story did last night. Tom, welcome, my brother. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you for thank coming you. Uh, out and taking the time, uh, as we always do. Uh, we are getting to know each other live on camera. And uh, I am kind of representing the um, uninformed audience. And so that's why I like to do it this way. And so I'll ask you questions they might be thinking too, because you're telling the story for the first time to me. Yes. And I think that helps us bring out more facts and relax. If you if there's anything you're uncomfortable with, if I ask you something you don't like, um, I, I'm not comfortable with that, Sean, or whatever. But let's go through. And I love to start out with learning about Tom, and then as you move on through your life, uh, bring in your wife and then bring in children and, and church activity or conversions, all of that stuff, and take us up in this first hour to uh, the point of when something went wrong in, in your life, okay. all right? <clears throat> I'd be glad to. Uh, well, I'm from uh, West Virginia. I was uh, born and raised in Southern West Virginia, and uh, I was uh, part of a, a broken home. My mother and father divorced when I was four months old, mm. and uh, I was uh, with my mother approximately about six years of my life, my father maybe a year, and approximately about 12 different foster homes. Wow. Growing up and uh, so. Rough. Interesting, interesting childhood. Yeah. I have one brother and one sister, which I'm the youngest of all three. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they're, they're still alive, and, but uh, they're damaged as mm -hmm. myself. Uh, uh, we were abused as children ourselves. Mm -hmm. As growing up, uh, I know from six to, uh, Six years old to about 15, uh, I lived with, with my mother. It was part of a, uh, she was part of a, an organized Christian cult, sex cult. And uh, it was very, very rough. Wow. So when you say organized Christian, are you talking about um, uh, it was an organized uh, group, or are you talking about it was like a denomination that would be known around the world? Uh, it was, no, it wasn't no. known. They were secret. They wore their capes, their, their, their mask, and it was in the basement with candles and individuals there. They had, uh, I remember on the, on the one altar stand they had, uh, they had, it was a, a lamb. They actually had lamb blood in it. And uh, I remember having, whew, sorry, I right. remember having, you know, the blood poured on me, the, the cuts on my body that they would make, uh, the sexual acts that came forth from that, from members. And I do remember the pastor of the church that we attended was part of that too and uh and my biological mother and stepfather what the that hell too, so. but you know i made it i made it through it and uh made me made me stronger made me want to fight yeah my whole life I, it's made me a fighter okay oh, and uh, i have always stood for truth and justice and uh anybody that knows me and knows that if you're wrong i'm gonna i'm gonna come after you and i'm gonna point you out wow and uh so praise god that, that's because I, I think, well, I exactly think that's what our Heavenly Father would want to be done. Mm, sure. You know, he, he wouldn't want that, and He'd want you to stand up for the truth. And, yeah. and that's what I try to do. I'm nowhere perfect. You know, I've, I've made mistakes in my life, and, mm. and I've repented for them. But, you know, I, I, I just, I'm a fighter. And, but that's the only way to survive, mm. <laughs> I feel. So at 15, the law was never involved in those things going on with that crazy religious group? Uh, actually, one of the individuals... Part of that was a state trooper from Southern West Virginia. Wow. So uh, yeah, he was involved in it. I, I recall going, 
ran away from school, actually. I was uh, in the fourth grade at that point, and where I lived at, it was only like two officers in the county, small southern West Virginia. And I remember running away and going up to the police station and went in to say, hey, I need to tell what's going on. And so the trooper said, well, I'll talk to you. Well, we need to get in the car. Well, he drove me back to my parents' home, and he was come to find out he was part of that, because I know the next experiment in the basement, he, he made sure he took his hood off to let me see that wow. it was him. So. Wow. I got beat pretty bad that day, but it's okay. I made it. It made me tougher. You know, in this state, uh, doing ministry in Utah, I've heard innumerable stories. Yeah. Met with people who tell these. But they're so difficult to, to verify, and the damage done to the people involved is so brutal that they have a hard time articulating the facts because they were young, and so they're discredited because they're emotionally disturbed usually. And it's never, you're never ever able to put your finger on it to really, and, and this is such a surprise that back in West Virginia, in a Christian cult, yes. this happens to you and what you're in your uh, late 40s, 50s now? I'm 57 now. You're, 50, so, you're yes, now the sir. same age. Yeah, oh, yes, yeah. Sir. So uh, going back, way back in the day, they were doing this stuff in the name of religion and, 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 and yes. it's amazing. Yeah, they always had their, their book they read from and you know, you could, I, I, didn't, I didn't, can't recall, remember the exact words they were saying because I didn't understand them. I just, I mostly just closed my eyes and waited for it to get over. Wow. So, so at 15, you said from whatever, six or eight to 15, and what happened at 15? I was able to run away again, and uh, I was able to get into the system. Mm. Uh, I had told them what had happened, but it, nothing happened of it. They just said, well, you're not going back. We'll put you in foster care. Mm. So I bounced around from different foster homes. I lived with several aunts and uncles, and you know, mm. it was there, but uh, it made me strong. I remember the, the day I graduated, from high school, the day before, my foster family says, well, you graduate tomorrow, so you need to start packing up. And because uh, they didn't get any more, you know, public yeah. assistance and stuff for me. So I joined the military and mm. was able to leave the very next day, so. What branch? Uh, Army, yes. An Army man. Yes, sir. Wow. I served in Oklahoma for a year and Germany for two years. No kidding. But uh, never know wartime, so thank God. Because mm -hmm. so, I'm glad I don't didn't have to deal with that. But. It helped me grow up and helped me find myself mm. a lot, so. No anger issues? You seem like such a uh, nice man. I, I do have some anger issues. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I'm, you know, I'm being treated and I'm on medications okay. for that. Uh, I do have some massive PTSD, it kicks in sometimes. Mm. And, but uh, it, the word I hate the worst is an F word, so. But if I, if I say that word, that's when everybody tells me, okay, we're leaving. <laughs> so. Uh, you hate uh, it, when it comes out, run. Oh, I, I, I just, yes, I hate that word because I do, but I'm, you know, I've been able to control it better mm. to get there. I, I know when things have happened here in the past few years too, it's been very hard. Wow. Because my, my mind has been saying, you know, you just need to eliminate these people. Wow. You know, just take them off the face of the earth. They don't deserve to be breathing for what they've done to my children, my family, and other families. Mm. And uh, it was my thought. Uh, I found mm. myself a few times at their home Mm. wanting to drag them out of their home, but luckily uh, the good Lord blessed me and mm. I got back home. Mm. And uh, so that's why I thought, well, I can't kill them physical, physically because, you know, that would hurt my family more. Mm -hmm. And uh, not that I'm a killer or anything yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. It's just the thought I was so angry and, I, and I'm still angry. Mm. But I've, I prayed to God and I said, Heavenly Father, what can I do? What do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. And the answer I got was to speak, you know, to help others, to speak out, to tell my story, because mm. you know, to try to put a stop to this, because it's everywhere. Mm. I mean, I, I I never dreamed, you know, I went well from a church from a child, but to such a large organization mm -hmm. as the Mormon Church, I just they they caught me. I, I say they caught me with my pants down. Mm. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. I didn't expect it. Wow. I really didn't. Wow. And uh, it's been hard, but the Lord gives me strength every day. And it's amazing to hear you give him credit at all. There's people who have things happen to them where the Lord becomes the absentee manager who is indifferent to uh, their plight. And it's amazing that all, all these things, that you went to the military, you had anger issues, what happened as a child, and you didn't go off and, you know, go, as they would say back in my youth, postal yeah. on people and just take them all out. I, it's, it was hard. I've yeah. had some moments in my life where uh, I've come close to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's been some people that uh, 
that I've, I mean, I've, I played rugby in college and uh, I, I dealt with my anger a lot there because mm. it's amazing the frustration and the anger you can let out in a rugby game. <laughs> so <laughs> I know my first game was against uh, Penn State University and uh, I don't know, I just, to hit someone and be hit too, I was like, yes, this is, this is what I like. So you, you were in the uh, military, the Army, uh, how many years did you do? Four? Uh, three years. Three years? Yes, sir. And then did you go to college thereafter? I, I did. I, well, when I came out, I went to go to college the first time and I got sidetracked, like most people do when they go to college. Yeah. Uh, got into the, the party and the uh -huh. not going to class and uh -huh. having fun. And uh -huh. uh, so I, I went away from that, but then I just started working jobs. Uh, I got a job, uh, I was working. Uh, at the uh, West Virginia University Hospital, actually. I got a job as an assistant autopsy, mm. assistant autopsy. So I did autopsies, uh, mm. assisted with those for approximately two and a half years. And mm. uh, actually, I was, I was going to go down that field, and uh, but the state eliminated our job there. So, but that's when I had uh, met my wife now, and uh, I saw her. She was, I was actually, What's was very- What's her first name? Juliet. Juliet. Yeah. Yes, sir. If I was just Romeo, it would be set. Uh, you, oh, you're a Romeo. We <laughs> oh, can no, tell right oh, no. now. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was interesting. The first time I saw her, I was actually, actually on a date with another girl. But uh, I was stopping at the place because she was just starting the college, and uh, it still cracks me up. But uh, I pulled into the, the parking lot there because I needed to talk to her manager because he played on a softball team that we played on. Mm. And I saw her interviewing, and she just had a glow about her. Mm. And I was like, I couldn't take my eyes off of her. And I was like, my heart was just pulling to her, so I asked, you know, the girl, we weren't seriously dating, I said, I need to go inside here a second. So she waited in the car, and I went in, talked to my friend, the manager, I said, what is her name? And he had told me, I said, are you going to hire her? He said, oh, absolutely. <laughs> and so I thought, okay. So I started going there just checking her out. I mean, she said, I, I guess I was stalking her, I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't intentionally stalking, but right. uh, I, don't, I was just drawn to her. I just, I thought, okay, I, this lady's got to be a part of my life. But uh, I kind of felt like, I don't know if this will make sense. I kind of felt like I was kind of on a mission mm -hmm. at that time because I was I had quit drinking uh, because I was an alcoholic for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I started every day off with my eggs and toast and my beer and two shots Jack Daniels. That's Ooh. how I started my day before I went to work. And uh, but uh, it, uh, luckily, I mean, a lot of people say it's not luck, but uh, I, I had a DUI. Mm. And the time I was arrested, the only time I got in trouble law and it opened my eyes. Because mm. when I got out of jail the next morning, I, I saw the vehicle that I was driving and I knew the Lord is what got me out of that alive. Mm. And uh, I know the people that said when I crashed, they came out, they said I got out of the car, walked around, looked at the front of the car and I kicked it and then I just passed out. So, <laughs> but, uh, but it was an eye opener. So mm. I, you know, I started praying. I thought, okay, my life going down drain and I just turned my life over to God and I said you guide me Heavenly Father and, mm. uh, and that's when I met Juliet and mm. met a couple girls before that and I thought okay I need to teach people about God mm. and uh, had a couple ladies who were atheists and I don't down down mm -hmm. him at all but mm -hmm. I thought okay I want to teach you about God and they said well we don't believe in God I said well let's go out, I'll go on a date with you if we do this if I can just read, read you a couple of scriptures and when I met my wife Juliet and she told me she was she only dates members, and I thought, well, I'm a member of a lot of the bars around here and yeah. stuff. So I said, what are you a member of? And she said, the, the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter Day Saints. More, I thought, oh gosh, you're my next person that God wants me to save. Yeah, wow. <laughs> so you know, I knew I thought I came in my mind. I thought that's why I was so attracted to you. God wants me to help you. But uh, so wait a second. So before Juliet, you meet, you learn she's LDS. You dated a few girls who were atheists, and you you felt a mission. Um, was this because you felt you had God with you from a child, even though that they were doing crazy things uh, in the Christian community? Did you have a belief in God? It sounds like you have had a relationship with Him. The DUI afterward, you're talking to Him. You've always had a relationship with I God? I always had a relationship with my Heavenly Father because there's, there's no way when I look back that I got through some of the things I did. And my brother and sister got through the things they did. I know there was a presence there mm. that helped us. Mm. And a lot of times with the beatings and things that just, I didn't feel them sometimes. Mm. And I know there was something there taking that pain for me. Mm. And it was, uh, I, I just knew there was something there. Mm -hmm. I, I knew he was there. And uh, 
I'm going to jump a little bit ahead because we're going to get to this. Well, but it, it's just timely, Tom, that uh, we have, there's a lot of people who say, there's no God, my child died, or I've had, I got cancer, or I was molested, or any of the stories that we can look at in our life. You can choose to say, there's no God, or you can choose to say, there is. What is it about what you went through and what then you've gone through, which we'll talk about later, that you're still sitting here and you're, where is God in all these things in your, in your estimation? How, had, how did he let young Tom get cut and be abused and, and, and all that? I uh, honestly, in my heart, totally believe he didn't let any of it happen. Oh, okay. I believe that God has a purpose for everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I believe he was there. I believe he cried every step of the way with me. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, <sighs> sorry. I believe that there was a purpose for it. Mm. And, I, and I'm beginning to see what I truly feel that purpose is. I, see. I, I think our Heavenly Father truly wanted me to, not wanted me to, but He made the best of what I went through to build me stronger. He gave me that strength mm -hmm. to be able to fight for others. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I want to do. You know, I want to fight for my children, mm. other children. Mm. And I believe I'm doing what He wanted, but it's what I want in my heart because that's what I feel is right and it's important. We kind of saw that in Christy Johnson's story last night in the film that all the hell she went through oh, as a kid, yes, sir. but look where she's come and what she's doing now. Oh. And God kind of, you know, he kind of is there. Okay, I have to, you're gonna go through hell. I mean, freedom of choice here with people. They suck, oh. but yes. I am here to care, help carry you and make it better in the end. Oh, absolutely. Christy is an amazing woman. Yeah. I mean, I just feel so honored to know her mm -hmm. and to get to meet her. I mean, her energy and her empowerment. I mm -hmm. mean, last night watching the, the premiere, I cried probably 90% through it. Wow. I, re I relived a lot of my childhood mm -hmm. things, but then I relived my own children's abuse. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt like I couldn't breathe a couple of times last night. Mm -hmm. I had to hold on to my son, mm -hmm. his leg, and uh, her son, actually Christy's son, was sitting by me, and his energy was at our shoulder, our arms were touching, you could just feel his energy, the love he had for his mom, and it's just the good, good people, but I'm, I'm, it empowers me more mm -hmm. to meet someone like her, mm -hmm. you know, that's been through the same thing, abused by your own biological parent, mm -hmm. and uh, it was uh, so empowering. Wow. When I went, went back to the hotel last night, uh, my son had fallen asleep, he wasn't feeling well, and I just went into the bathroom and shut the door, and I, I sat in over two hours crying. Mm. And just, I couldn't get up off the floor. Mm. I couldn't even raise my hands mm. to get a drink that I had sitting there. It, it kind of paralyzed me, but mm. it just, I relived so much. But then I just felt this presence, and it just uplifted me, and it's like, okay, you, you know what you need to do now. And uh, it's to help others, and that's what I want to do. Anything I could do to help someone, to help my children. And you're doing it. Yes, sir. It, well, even my son last night, he came away from there. He says, Dad, I'm feeling a lot better. Mm. He says, you know, I can talk more about what happened to me now. Mm. And, uh, and I said, you, before he never would want to speak of it. Mm. He says, do you think I can help somebody? that you know, like her, and, and I could smile and be happy and be able to do I said, son, you can do anything you want. I said, you keep faith in God and you'll do it. And I saw him heal a lot last night. Wow. So I, I think Christy thought of my heart. Yeah. I truly do. Yeah. Sorry. No, 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 sorry needed. So you meet uh, Juliet. Yes, sir. Do we have any tissue? Oh, I get, a, there's some a, tissue right down there, Tom. Okay, it's okay. I try to get these, these staff members who are highly paid to take care of such things. Oh, they let me down every time. <laughs> They're fine. Thank you. Uh, Tom, so uh, you've met Juliet. Yes, sir. She has a radiance, and it's interesting because many LDS people do. They attribute it to possessing the truth of the gospel. I attribute it to healthy living. 
Yes. Uh, you know, if, if you look at health, people who live healthy, they have a healthy radiance. Yes. So she has a healthy radiance. What happened then? You're working with her then? Oh yeah, I, well I wasn't working with her. I, would, I knew her schedule because her, her boss told me. So I guess I was stalking. You are, stalking. you're a, you're a I stalker. Guess I'm a stalker, okay. Add that to your resume. <laughs> okay, I never, I've had a few people say, you stalked her? I thought, no, I'm not a stalker, but I guess I am now. I guess I have to accept that and, and, and own it, right? Yeah. So, uh, but I knew her schedule and I'd make sure I stopped in and saw my friend and say hi to her and uh, she would give me the time of day. She mm -hmm. just, she says, I not only date members, the church, and I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? I tried every pickup line, everything I've ever <laughs> done in my life or used. She shot me down every time. Sure. So I thought, okay, you know, I, I said, Heavenly Father, what am I supposed to do here? But I don't know, it just intrigued me more. I wanted to get to know her more. Because she did have a, a spiritual presence with mm -hmm. her. And over 26 years of marriage, I have never in my life met or known anyone that has such a pure heart as she did. Mm -hmm. She she lived the the gospel, the Mormon Church, twenty four seven. Mm -hmm. I never heard her speak ill of anyone. Wow. She sees good and saw good in everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, every night she always read her scriptures and pray. You know, teach our children about God and just an amazing wife. I mean, I just I, I don't know why I ever did deserve to be a part of her life, but it was a, you know I, I was grateful for it. So did you convert then because of her? I did. Yeah, she got, she talked to me. She says, well, uh, would you like to meet missionary, come to church with me? And I thought, hmm, okay, maybe I could do that. I'll try. So I did go with her on a Sunday, mm. and it happened to be a fast testimony meeting. Mm. And I sat there, and, uh, and, and I did feel, I thought I felt the Spirit. I saw good in people. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of good. You know, you could tell they were good people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I ended up taking uh, the discussions, which I tried to, teach to missionaries instead. Mm -hmm. I tried to correct them on everything, but uh, but I ended up joining the church. You know, what you do for love, right? <laughs> How old so were you? I was, uh, I believe, 24, 23 24. or 24, yes, sir. But uh, yeah, I always say, you know, look what I did for love, you know, I joined the Mormon church, you know? <laughs> but, uh, but I love the aspect about family, you know, and about being together for eternity, that, that intrigued me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, I love, love that. Because mm -hmm. at that point, in my life, I never once thought of having a child, being a father, because I never wanted to have a child on this earth, because I was scared that I didn't want them to ever go through or even come close to anything that I lived through as a child. And I, I never intended to be a father. But uh, Did you find any inconsistency between your heartfelt feelings for God, who's always been with you, yes. and what you heard and learned in Mormonism about God, or, or was it pretty consistent for you? The spirit of love was consistent, or, or is that how you kind of saw it? I saw it, well, I always, well, my 20 some years as a Mormon, I always had my moments of disagreeing and standing up and saying, okay, I, I, don't, I, I don't believe that. Mm. I'm not gonna do that. Mm. I'm not gonna live that but I'm gonna do what I know is right for me and my wife and family. You know, I just, I guess I kept my mouth shut, but actually I didn't keep my mouth shut. I was always speaking up. So yes, I've, I've had a few run-ins with a lot of church members, leaders. Did and you? Uh, But you know, I, I grew to, to love the gospel. I served many a callings mm -hmm. in the church, you know, all the way up from young men's, elders corn president, uh, addiction recovery coordinator, mm -hmm. uh, a temple worker for seven and a half years. Wow. and. Uh, so, you know, I tried to honor what I was doing. I tried to serve God and to, to do what He wanted me to do. But during that time, too, I always had some run-ins because I was always, I couldn't, I, I never was able to accept something if I didn't believe it. And uh, it was hard. I had some hard times, but. Did you buy into the whole Joseph Golden Plates, Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Prize, Doctrine and uh, Covenants, Temple? You must have you must have bought into the temple somewhat. You worked in there, right? I did. It was yeah. a calling, and it made my wife very happy that I accepted it. And uh, but I did it because I thought, okay, maybe I'm not seeing something. Maybe mm -hmm. it, it is true. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, I do believe. A lot of it is true because mm -hmm. it has a lot of good godly mm -hmm. principles in it. But uh, the polygamy thing, no, that just blew me out of the water. I ne never believed that. I thought mm -hmm. I thought he was a child molester from the beginning. Mm -hmm. 
but I didn't worship him, mm -hmm. and I never would. Yeah. But I, I worshiped Heavenly Father, the God that I that I believe in. Got it. And uh, so, yeah, I, all my time in church, I never accepted a, a speaking assignment to talk about Joseph Smith mm -hmm. because it's not about him. Mm -hmm. I would talk about Heavenly Father or something like that or children, mm -hmm. but couldn't talk about him. Mm -hmm. And I, I never, never could accept that. But you know, I did, uh, I, I did, I, you know, I got involved with the church. They called me as a addiction recovery coordinator, then ended up being a regional coordinator where I was over uh, parts of West Virginia, Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and did I say Virginia? Mm -hmm. to West, yes, uh, where I would go into the states and I would train facilitators to wow. run the addiction program, mm. which I didn't like the 12-step program that they had. Mm. Uh, it was very, I don't know, I, I call it the book with no words in it, because mm. it was just a plain 12-step program that needed more. Mm. So uh, I took it upon myself oh. to change it. Uh, I changed it to a Dictionary Recovery Challenge Program, mm. because the individuals that I dealt with and worked with and tried to help, it wasn't just alcohol or drugs. I mean, it was eating disorders. It was, you know, any, you know, from, Anger issues, you know, porno pornography. Oh my gosh, I cannot Huge. believe, you know, I believe how many bishops that I counseled with that, that had pornography issues. Yeah. Even a uh, second counselor in the state presidency, you know. Oh, but yeah. you know, it's confidential, you know, I did things different. I met afterwards with people if they wanted to talk one on one, and I'd do everything I could to help them. And it, it, it empowered me, it made me, made me happy. To it, see success? What, to see success in someone else anything I could do to help someone. And I fell in love with that calling, I did. I, I just, nice. I saw some lives change, and not because of me, because of them. Mm -hmm. And so many of them just needed someone to talk to. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, it, was, it was mind blowing how many would say, I can't talk to my bishop about this. And I've had many say, you know, I've talked to my bishop, you know, I've told him about my pornography, they just told me not to watch it no more, and you know, and you'll be okay. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, no, that's yeah. not it. They, they actually needed help with it. And I tried to do the best I could. Oh, I bet you did. With it, you know, I'm sure I failed some, but I, I hopefully I helped some others. But it was them and God, you know, I was just a little mouthpiece there from ears listening and uh, trying to help the best I could. You told me a lot about your heart and the fact that you always stuck with Jesus. You didn't get up and bear testimony of Joseph Smith. Polygamy was an affront to you from the beginning. It tells me a lot about you as a man. The only thing I thought was right with Mormonism was polygamy. So, and that tells you a lot about me. Oh, no, see, no. So, there, this is it. I, you can see that you're a, you're a man without guile. You, you, you've tried, and, and I love that about you because you're, you're showing, look, I've just, I was a Mormon, okay, I was a Mormon, but I was trying to help addicts and be honest, and I love it, yes. really love it. After you joined, how long before you got married, or did you get married first and then join? Oh, no, we, uh, she, she drove me crazy. <laughs> before I met her, I, you know, I dated a lot of girls. I was very sexually active and a lot of things, you know, what normal men do, what I consider normal. But uh, dating her, we dated for three years because she made a promise to wait. She graduated from college wow. to her mother to do that. And I got slapped several times. So I, you know, my hand's like, no, you don't do that. So, but you know, I, I, I grew to respect her for that. And then I, I knew, I thought, well, it's not about my sexual needs or, you know, my needs that I need. This is about her. I, it's another thing I loved about her, and I, I loved her for who she was, and I wasn't going to damage her. Mm. I wasn't going to say, okay, no, I'm going to leave you if we don't have sex or, mm. if, you know, if we don't do something there like that. That, that would have been so wrong. Another and, indicator uh, of the man you are. Oh, no. No, no, no I got slapped a couple times. Try, right, I'm telling well, that, you. That's <laughs> my, expected. Yeah, my manly, my manly desires <laughs> broke down a few times. And <laughs> I went home, took more than one cold shower, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was like, oh, my goodness. I so thought, three years. Uh, and then we got married. Temple? Temple, the Washington, D.C. Temple. No kidding. And there we were married. And, right uh, there off the Beltway. Right off the Beltway, yes, sir. Mm. And uh, I, I remember she came out of the... Uh, the, the room the, where the ladies come out and she was in her dress and everything and I just I, my knees buckled I, I hit the floor I just she was so beautiful and radiant and I just it was just wonderful and I just wanted to spend my life with her because she became my life wow. and and I wanted to to be there for her try to be the best husband I could be and 
And that's when, you know, I thought, okay, man, we could do a family because this, this lady, I knew she would be an incredible, loving mother. Mm. And, uh, oh, sorry, she's just an, an amazing woman. I, I just, I love, that's when I thought, okay, we can have children. And that's when we begin to have children. You know, we have four boys. Four uh, boys. Yes, sir. So 24, 19, 16, and 13. And one granddaughter. Wow. <laughs> so, but in her example, as a mother, throughout the years, watching her with the children, uh, I just, I thought, wow, this is what a mother mm. is supposed to be. This is what, I thought, if I could go back, if I can make myself little, I'd love for her to be my mom, you know, mm. to see her, you know, she had rules, you know, they got in trouble, they did something wrong, and, but she did it in, with love. Mm. And uh, I was like, how do you do that, you know? Mm. And it taught me a lot about love too, and how to love and connect because I've always been a, a protective person. Even with my own children, uh, from the age that they were born till almost 14, 15 years old, well, my youngest two not, but I kept baby monitors in their rooms just because I could tell you which child turned over in the bed, which one to cough. I was just, I didn't want no one to come in and hurt them. And I was always, and that's something that was me, I wanted to protect them. I always, that was just me. High alert. High alert. I just wanted to, him to have a safe childhood mm. and to grow and to be able who Heavenly Father wanted him to be. I got to point something out, Tom, and that is to our audience who, uh, they're what I call mean evangelicals. We have a lot of uh, secret viewers who are uh, the guys who are attacking Mormons all the time. And, you know, I have attacked Mormonism myself and I still will for some of the stuff, but um, the fact that you're sitting here and you're telling me about a woman who was LDS and faithful to it, and you said she's the most loving, true Christian, essentially, is what you're saying. Yes. That you've ever met. Correct. Lived, and, and, and that's a product of something that came out of that religion. Now, I don't know what it is. Yes. It's the good things that you said. Yes. Sir. The good yes. things. Yes. And, and it is possible for that to happen. And I think until we admit that, it, we're going to continually be like this with all this hatred and stuff. Yes. And we got to knock some of that down. So it's real, I really appreciate you you're describing your wife this way. Oh. Um, because often the religion turns some people into just not good people. But yours is an, is an exception, or maybe yours is, is, is uh, an experience that happens more than we like to admit. You yes, know? Sir. And so I think that's important in the dialogue. You decide to have kids, you have four boys. Yes, sir. Households of boys are wild places. Yes. And uh, then what? You're working. You yes, guys sir. are living the church. You're doing the gospel. Going to the temple. Yes, sir. We were faithfully going to the temple every month. Even when we lived four or five hours away, we would drive mm -hmm. on the weekend. We were very active. You know, we paid our tithing. We were the, the good Mormons. You know, we did the best we did. Our always did our home teaching, visiting teaching. You know, we served our callings to the best we could. Wow. And uh, of course I had some run-ins though in the church. I did, you know. I, I know when my oldest son turned eight years old and I baptized him, uh, this is where one of my anger, man, anger's coming out. I was sitting in Sunday school holding him and because uh, he wasn't feeling well and he was leaning against me. And I had a uh, gentleman, a member come up and just pat me on the shoulder and looked up and he whispered and he said, your son's not really baptized. And I said, excuse me? Because he was at his baptism the week before. He says, no. He said, uh, I saw his toe come up out of the water. What? And I was like, what? He said, yeah, so he's not really baptized. You're going to need to redo it. And I said, well, there were two witnesses there. You know, they're supposed yeah, to redo yeah. him. And uh, he said, well, if you don't want to be with your son, that's fine. He turned off and walked away. And I, I kind of went berserk on him. I got up and I handed my child. Well, he, he ran. <laughs> and I can tell you right now. Nice! He locked himself in the clerk's office. And I could testify to you, the Mormons know how to build buildings. You cannot tear down a, a Mormon door. Yeah. It's not going to happen. I've got, I had surgery on my shoulder to testify to that because I tried to break that door down. Wow. And uh, I remember I thought, okay, I told my wife, I said, I have to go. Uh, if not, I'm going to kill this man. Yeah. I was just, that's PTSD. It clicked in. and Because wow. uh, I felt he, he, he came after my son. Yeah. And I thought, this guy, he needs his head ripped off. Wow. And. Uh, so I went to leave, but the bishop ended up talking me into coming to his office and talk to this gentleman. I know the bishop was there with two other counselors and, and him too, and 
he, he said he wants to apologize to you. Well, he, he said, oh, I'm sorry, Brother Stallings, but the grin on his face, I saw that grin, so I just, I went for his throat immediately. So I had him against the wall, but they were able to get my hand loose away from him, and he ran back into the clerk's office again. And uh, uh, they tried to keep me from getting to him, and I, I remember some of it. I knew the bishop went over his desk, uh, his counselor went over a couple of chairs, and nice. So I, I kind of this was my anger, so I, I kind of lost it. So it's but, all right. Uh, but, I love it. Yeah, but they 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 kept him locked in the clerk's office <laughs> until I left. So, uh, but uh, when I left, I went to the man's house. Actually, I was waiting on him to come back home from church. So, but uh, sitting there on his front doorsteps, waiting on him, here came the bishop and his son, and they're like. Tom, why are you here? And I said, well, why are you here? Uh, Your wife said you would come here. I said, well, I guess she was right. <laughs> but you know, they talked and I calmed down and uh, thought, okay, we could do this. And the sad thing, but the funny thing about it, two weeks before that, uh, in leadership meetings, they were talking about no one wants to be this man's home teacher because mm -hmm. no one can handle him. I thought, I can do that. Mm. You know, I could be patient with him <laughs> and be all right. but. Uh, I immediately got released from his home teacher, so, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, you know, I felt bad to do that because I know they were people in the church that saw my outburst, and uh, and I felt bad for that. Sure. I, you know, I apologized to him for that. I just I snapped. Yeah. yeah. And um, I mean, he did come up a few weeks later to church and wanted to shake my hand and apologize, and I said, "Well, I appreciate you apologizing, but I'm not ready for the handshake yet." I just couldn't do it because I felt he attacked my son, and mm -hmm. and that just put me in fight mode. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, I got over it, and, and it moved on. So the interesting thing is that you've been on high alert. He didn't even want to have kids. He didn't want to bring kids into this world. You find a woman. You trust that you two can do it. You bring him four sons, and then we go on attack mode when someone even suggests that they're not baptized because the toe came up. Well, I don't know what the motive is behind that psycho, yeah. but. And so you are, have your child, that's the, that's the thing is the challenge, the children that, and so what happens now? We're almost at the end of our first hour and our first part. What is the first thing that happened where all of this starts to unravel? Tell our audience what was introduced to your family, what just initially happened, we'll get to the details in our next part, um, about your children, you and your wife, the ward, the stake, your family, what happened? Well, what had happened, a, uh, an individual that we knew, a young man, uh, Michael Christopher Jensen was his name. He, uh, no one ever knew, but uh, he was a friend of my oldest son. You know, he grew up through Young Men's, through the scouting program. We knew his family, we knew him. Uh, the mother and father, they were, strict like military all the time you know they marched in in a straight line every morning the sacrament they go across the back go up the right side and sit on the very front row where they could see the bishop and everybody face to face they would sit like statues you know everyone knew there was something not right there but no one knew but uh, through leadership i did know that the church was working with him because you know he had had an affair of his wife and he was abusive and they had signed another high councilman with him and and I recall saying, well, why is he a high councilman? Why is he a leader? Oh, well, it'll help him grow. The human leadership, it'll help him get through his issues of, you know, abuse of family and things too. So I, I, I don't know, I just, there was red flags there everywhere. But uh, what happened was he was brought back, they sent him on his mission to Mesa, Arizona. Michael Jensen. Michael Jensen, Christopher Jensen. And I believe about halfway through his mission, he had uh, came back home. When uh, we saw him in church, we are like, whoa, why is he back home early from his mission? But that's when the bishop, the stake president, had announced and you know told other leaders he's back because he hurt his back on a bicycle and he's coming back to heal, then he'll be going back on his mission. So that, that's a lie. Mm -hmm. They lied to her and that's where it all began. They, uh... can we take a break? I'm sorry. We... Let's take a break. In fact, it's a good time to take a break. Okay. Tom, uh, we're gonna pick it up from here. Sorry. No, 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 you just relax. 
we'll uh, pick it up from here and uh, talk about uh, this, the situation. The interesting thing is we just pointed out how the religion was able to produce uh, a beautiful person or help produce a beautiful person like your wife. At the same time, it was able to produce or help produce some monsters. Exactly. And, and, uh, and, and so that's kind of the lesson of religion, isn't it? It is. And you got to kind of approach it that way. Okay. And we'll pick it up about how those monsters affected your life and everything else when we come back next time. Thank you very much. Nice I appreciate it. Thank you.